Hello, Thought Roomies, and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Hallie Rose. First of all, I am just so excited to see all of the reviews pouring in for the Thought Room. Last episode, I put out a call to all of you in our community asking you to help us in our goal of hitting 200 written reviews on Apple Podcasts this month, and we still need your help. So if you're a listener of this show and you've not yet left a review, even just a line or two helps so much. And the more reviews that we have, the more all of the magical algorithms of the internet push our show up and it gets found by more people. So by helping us, you're really helping us reach way more people and spread these messages of love and empowerment and healing. So if you're about that, please take a second, even while you're listening to this intro, you can type something really quick, just a line or two, something about one of your favorite episodes, and just let us know that you really enjoy the show. It helps a ton. On top of that, if you do leave a review, be sure to leave your Instagram handle in the review so that we can automatically enter you to win a one-on-one coaching call with me. We're going to be announcing the winner of that at the end of the month. So please be sure to put your Instagram handle in there or another way that we can contact you. And who knows, you and I just may end up on the phone together talking about your life, your dreams, your journey, and the expansion of your own consciousness. On the show today, I am so excited to present to you my dear new friend, Brandilyn Clay. She is an incredibly talented healer, creatrix of sound, and a gorgeous expression of the healed divine feminine. This interview, we go so deep. And we touch on some really intimate and vulnerable pain points that I know will resonate with a lot of you in your own journeys. We talk about birth and we talk about death and we talk a lot about orgasm. So there's something for everybody here, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're in partnership or whether you're single, there's something here for you. And please listen through to the end. If there's something from the show that resonates with you, I've been loving watching all of you tag us on Instagram lately. And we love resharing those little quotes and video screen grabs and captures from your favorite moments and your favorite quotes from the show. So please don't forget to tag at Hallie underscore Rosebud and at Thought Room Podcast on Instagram so we can reshare. Without further ado, please step into the Thought Room with myself and Brandilyn Clay. Brandilyn Clay, welcome to the Thought Room. Thank you. Thank you. So happy to be here. We are here in your lovely home. And for anyone on audio, they can't see this, but anyone on video can see your gorgeous harp (laughs) over here and your lovely, lovely nest of a home. And the moment I walked in here, I could just feel that energy of of love and of home. And I'm so excited for everything we're going to dive into today. And you and I met about a month ago, I believe at at an event that you were hosting. And for anyone listening who listened to the episode with Charles Clay, (laughs) that's your beloved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to start off today just by tuning in and I want to hear, you are just, you are so talented in so many ways. So when I first met you, you had this beautiful sound healing that you led. And I was so impressed by all the different instruments that you could play. First and foremost, it's like the harp 
is not an easy instrument. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know the last time I heard a harp in person. It's just not something we get the gift of stumbling upon. So for one, I would love to hear how that came into your life, but also, you know, you have this angelic voice and you play the sound bowls and sounds a really big piece of, of what you do and who you are. So I would love if you would talk about how that came into your life and you can go as far back as you need to in order to contextualize sound healing for us, but perhaps you could start there. Yeah. I grew up singing. I was singing on key at like six months to the theme song of Ariel, like the little Mm. mermaid. And my family has that all on videos. And so I was super blessed to have parents who really encouraged me musically Mm. and saw that I loved to sing. And so they put me in singing lessons at a young age and put me in piano lessons. And I had some first years of that, um, getting really comfortable with singing. And then I was 11 years old and they took me to buy a new piano and they lost me in the instrument store and I, they found me in the harp room. And I was just sitting in the harp room by myself, like playing some basic, I think, twinkle, twinkle, little star on the harp because it's very much like a vertical piano without black mm. keys. And so they were like, okay. A harp it is. We're going to go with it. And um, I was in lessons for a couple of years and the harp is definitely a challenging instrument. It's, I've had my journey with it and I've found that in my life, my relationship with my instruments are a great mirror of my relationship with self on many levels. I had years of being too intimidated by the harp and I'd get this nervousness, this perfectionism with it. And so I had years of my life where I didn't play the harp at all. And the harp just kind of sat there and collected dust. And then as I did my inner work of finding deeper self-love and deeper self-acceptance and um, not allowing that perfectionism in me to be in the driver's seat as much, I just started playing it for fun and for beauty and for myself rather than for whoever was listening. And, um, and, you know, I had a pretty deep journey with, um, being raised Mormon and then falling out of the Mormon church at like 14. And so when I first left at the church, I started playing the drum kit. And I stopped singing and I didn't want to play the harp and I didn't want to do these things that identified me as like, they call it Molly Mormon, like super religious. And I was kind of angry Mm. with what I felt I had been taught that wasn't true. Mm. And it took me until I was 18 and discovered yoga and meditation at Naropa University and discovered a version of spirituality where I felt there was no hierarchy right? A universal form of spiritualism where I could feel myself as a spiritual being and not have to be part of any religion or dogma. And that's when I really started singing again and playing the harp again. Mm. And so my voice and my connection with my instrument of the harp um, has really coincided and had a flow with m- the ability for me to understand myself as a spiritual being mm-hmm. and to believe in myself as a spiritual being. And the disconnection with them has been a mirror of when I've lost that kind of identity in my own understanding of myself. Um, mm. And then the sound healing just naturally birthed itself out of being so devoted and dedicated to the healing arts um, from 18 on meditation and yoga and then studying psychology and realizing that sound is medicine and there's such a deeply therapeutic value to it for myself of really feeling my spirit come into my body through music and through sound and so it is my medicine and it's such an honor to be able to have that practice with self be shared and for that to be medicine that ripples out with other people as well. 
Mm. I love the way that you phrased it and how you speak about you started doing it just for the joy and the beauty of it. And then it became a thing. And I think that's really important to underscore is, is like the, the Dharma or our purpose. It really does come from this sort of organic wellspring that's in, in our spirit. It doesn't come from the mind and what makes sense. And when we try to drive things from the mind, it comes out a little inauthentic, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, if you do it the way that you did it, which is just following your passion, it can naturally expand into a career very easily. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to being raised Mormon. And you said you you fell out of the church at, at 14, but I'm sure it was less of a just gentle falling out and more <laughs> of an intentional leaving. Mm-hmm. So um, I'd love to hear more about that piece of the story, if you're willing to go there. Yeah, absolutely. It's so multidimensional, that story. Um, when I was also maybe 10 years old, around the time that I started to play the harp, I had a cousin mm-hmm. that committed suicide shot himself in the heart, and he was one out of five children in the family and the only one that wasn't religious and the oldest. And so he and his death was a catalyst that like broke the mold and created this opening for the whole family to reflect and to look at what happened and how he felt like an outsider. And that was a really hard time for me. I remember I was actually playing the piano when the phone rang. Wow. And we got the call about his death and we went down to my grandma's house and, you know, saw blood on a comforter that was being carried out. Wow. And, How old was he, did you say? Um, 35. Wow. Too young. Um, and so reflecting on that made me realize something's not right here. Somebody feels like an outsider. Somebody feels that they don't belong in our family. Mm-hmm. And it made me rethink what we were doing religiously, you know, at a young age. And so years go by from that kind of process. And um, I had seminary school, like church school, right after I had history class. And seminary, for those that don't know, is like the school for Mormons that is literally across the street from public schools. So it counts as one class, period. And so I was learning about like Martin Luther King and Mother Teresa and Gandhi. And then I'd go into seminary and I would raise my hand like, So is Gandhi going to go to the highest kingdom in heaven? And is Mother Teresa going to go to the highest kingdom in heaven? And their answer was no. And I just couldn't get behind that. And I loved John Lennon. I loved John Lennon. I loved the Beatles. And I would pray the way I knew how to pray. And then I'd feel like all the answers to my prayers were coming through me from John Lennon's voice and through Beatles Mm. songs, Let It Be, and All You Need Is Love. And so I very much had John Lennon like woven with Jesus as an archetype for a lot of my upbringing. And I wore a John Lennon shirt into seminary one day. And my teacher said, you can't wear that shirt in here. He sings a song that says, imagine there's no heaven. And imagine was like one of my favorite songs. Wow. And I was like, if I can't wear this shirt in here, I'm not going to be in here. And, and then in seminary, wow. you could volunteer to pray, and I volunteered to pray, and I went up and said a prayer, not too dissimilar from how I pray today in my authenticity of like, thank you, God, for the sunshine and the flowers and the gardens and the butterflies and the dolphins and just things that I feel genuine gratitude for. And I got sent into the hall and in trouble for praying that way and wow. going off script from the traditional Mormon prayer. To them, it sounded inauthentic. Hmm. So then this rebel rebellion, this inner rebel woke up inside of me and I was drawing pictures on top of my scriptures when I was sent out into the hall and started listening to the remote wow. and playing the drums. <laughs> and, and so that was the beginning of me not going to seminary school anymore. Um, they what also, did your parents say? 
during um, this time? They were in a process of kind of unraveling from the church themselves. Mm -hmm. I'd have my brother went on a mission for 10 days, which is supposed to be a two year long mission. So he came home early and the way that the community treated our family as though something bad had happened, like, Oh, your son's a sinner. Um, that energy wow. made our whole family like band together and kind of, um, leave the church with this domino effect. Um, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Many, many aspects of your, your story resonate with me. I was not raised Mormon. Um, my parents were actually very much, uh, they had gone through their own process of, of being raised Catholic and sort of distancing from that and raising their children in, in openness and, and Eastern philosophy and, you know, the Vedic texts and prayer, but, but very non-denominational. And I actually rejected them and I became a Baptist when I was, um, 16 and they were like, great, you know, do you go on your journey? But I remember the feeling of working at these Christian summer camps in the summer and fellowship and being told that, you know, it was my responsibility to bring my parents to Christ. And if I didn't, that, you know, they would be damned to hell. That was a lot of pressure for a 15, 16 year old. I remember that weighing on me all the time. And the breaking point for me because that was my community. And so it was a strange thing. I felt kind of isolated from my family because they weren't of the same faith. And then didn't really, some things weren't feeling right either in, in the group of people that I was, I was in, you know, it was kind of like we worked at the summer camp and I saw people bragging about how many children they converted in their cabin. Like, oh, well, I, my whole cabin converted to Christ, 12 girls. And, and it was like that where there were almost like these metrics of success. And I was like, wait, I don't, this doesn't feel authentic. Like, I don't know if, if that's the way we help people touch God. Um, we're saying the words, but are we really being it? Like, are we really meaning it? And my breaking point was when I got my first boyfriend and he was not a Christian. And I remember that inner pull because I had, this was a love that I was embodying. I was really feeling what love was. And for me, love is, is God. It's the expression of God embodied too for us as humans. And, and I remember that somebody at the camp started a rumor that I had sex. Mm -hmm. which was devastating to me because I actually had not. I was still a virgin. Mm -hmm. And that destroyed me that there were these like young, you know how young women can be, girls can be with gossip. And it was just like, there was this whisper of a, like the snake traveling through the whole camp of this lie that I had been sexually immoral when I was trying to be so straight and narrow and follow the scriptures and all of this stuff. And it broke me and I felt betrayed by my own community. And I really didn't believe, I didn't feel abandoned by God. I felt abandoned by the people that I believed had distorted his teachings. Um, so that was the moment I left and shortly thereafter did have sex with my boyfriend and <laughs> did not regret it for the record. But, um, so just many aspects of your story resonate. And I know you too have had quite a journey in your own sexual healing and the liberation of, of that inner wild woman. And I read something on your website, which I loved, but you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was something like, I believe we are innately entitled to love and bliss and joy and pleasure. And we come here to, to live and experience those things that it's not about living in punishment and fear and shame. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear more about 
your your journey of sexual healing and kind of like the scope of it to where you are now with your beloved and all that the two of you have cultivated in that sphere. Yeah, beautiful. And I so resonate with your share about that. I The story I described previously is what kind of began me leaving the church. And there was an experience with my sexuality that sealed the leaving of the church energetically. And I had a boyfriend from like 14 to 16. And the first time I gave him a blowjob, mm-hmm. the first time I experienced fellatio, um, I had to repent of it. And I was already inactive at the church, in the church at this time. And he was going to go on a mission. So he had to repent to his bishop to be able to be cleared in the temple and have the process of going on a mission. And this boyfriend lived like five miles away from me on the other side of town. And his bishop said to him that your girlfriend needs to go repent to her bishop. And if she doesn't, I have permission from the stake president to call her parents. So I was already not going to church and I went and made an appointment with the bishop to repent just to prevent my parents from getting a phone call saying, hey, your daughter gave her boyfriend a (laughs) phone shot. Yeah, that's an awkward call. (laughs) (laughs) And that experience was what did it for me. I walked into the room and I'm 15 years old and I was so nervous. I was shut down. I didn't even use my voice. And he said, I can tell that you're nervous and you don't want to say anything. So you can just nod your head yes or no when I ask these questions. And he asked, did you have clothes on? And I nodded my head no. He said, did you have sexual intercourse? Nodded my head no. Did you climax? Hmm. Did he Mm -hmm. climax? And I'm just not making eye contact, shaking my head, feeling so violated by these questions. And finally said, so was it fellatio? Did you have oral sex? And I nodded my head yes. And he said, okay, you cannot take the sacrament now for six months at Mm. church. And you're not allowed to pray out loud or offer a prayer for six months. And after you've had the six-month repentance process time, come back and see me and we can see if you'll be able to get a recommendation into the temple. (laughs) And it woke up the inner white witch inside of me. Mm -hmm. It was such an encumbered feeling of shame, such a thick, stagnant (sighs) feeling of shame. I knew in my soul and in my heart, this is not what God feels like. Like this is not Jesus. This is not Mm. truth. And I walked out of the Mormon church and I remember, you know, and this was before I had ever even known what energy healing was, but I remember like seeing this blue crystal light and putting like an X around the doors of the church energetically, like visualizing a blue light separating Mm. that energy from myself. And I promised myself there that I would never walk into a Mormon church again or identify as a member. And that was this big giving that energy back to where it comes from and calling my energy back to myself practice that intuitively just awakened Mm. in that moment without ever having had to be taught it. And I did experience my first orgasm when I was six years old. Wow. Okay. Tell me about that. I was in my grandmother's basement on her couch with a vibrator, like going, you know, one of those shoulder massage vibrators. <laughs> okay, I was like, wait, you had your <laughs> grandmother's <laughs> vibrator. My brain was catching up on the story. So it was like a shoulder massager. It was a shoulder yes. massager vibrator. And I was going up and down my legs, like just very innocently <laughs> and just accidentally stroked across my clitoris and was like, whoa, what was that? You know, and immediately I knew like, I hope that nobody's watching, like wait until everyone leaves the room and experienced it. And and I feel that in my soul, even at six years old was a very awakened Dakini, a very Mm. awakened sex priestess. From that moment, I knew that my orgasm was my connection to source, that that was the truest version of God and energetic replenishment that I had felt actually yes. touched me, you yes. know? Yeah. 
Yeah. Wow. Okay. I love this topic of <laughs> orgasm because it's been like popping up in my conversations mm-hmm. too lately with female friends. And I know for me, it's been such a journey mm-hmm. as well. And I know there's women out there that still are unable to experience orgasm mm-hmm. at all, period, end of story. Mm-hmm. But also many that struggle to have orgasm dur- during intercourse. And I was reflecting on my own journey. Like I said, I think I, n- I never really had issues um, helping myself orgasm and my self-pleasure practice, but mm-hmm. absolutely during intercourse, it just wasn't there until, oh, I want to say 2018. Mm-hmm. So really it's only been a couple years and I have some some strong feelings on how I got there. And it had a lot to do with self-healing, emotional healing, which you, you and I know that's it's that's not surprising in our sphere, but to some people listening, they go, Michael, what emotional healing being connected to my orgasm? How how what is being blocked and all of this? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can liberate ourselves into more orgasm. Uh, for women in particular, but also for men, what mm-hmm. do you think's in and around blocking us from experiencing pleasure? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we're all born with a deep sense of intuition and a deep sense of the knowing of ourselves and connection to source, connection to the divine. And life happens to us. And as life happens to us, it causes our connection to our intuition to shut down because of this heavy emotional energy, because of grief from loss or Mm -hmm. shame or fear of being judged or um, oftentimes for women and including myself, sexual violation or sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I think blocks us from reaching climax is not having the proper tools taught to us to clear that emotional energy in the body that creates this stagnation or this blockage to that connection to our own light, to our own divinity, to Mm -hmm. our connection to source. And I mean, we live in a culture where in public education, there is no real education on teaching children, teaching teenagers how to connect to their gifts, their intuitive senses. We have to really look in some hidden and secret places and schools to learn how to develop the right. skills of our intuition and learn how to clear that emotional energy that gets stuck in the body and that can come into our body from previous lifetimes. Right. right? And so... Um, I think that that's a big piece of it and feeling safe, feeling safe, mm, and feeling, feeling safe. deep trust. And I also believe that there is something to say for a deep um, resonance with your partner in terms of a soul connection yeah. that makes a really big difference. I. Huge. I definitely had partners that I didn't have orgasm with regularly. And um, like when I met my husband, I felt like there was this whole other gate that opened in my being to my inner goddess nature. It was like had been closed this whole time, but I had no idea. Right. And I remember actually having like during our love making a conversation with the goddess of her being like, Are you ready to open this gate? Here's this gate. Like you can open this to a deeper level of pleasure and ecstasy and chemistry with him. This is here. And I remember saying, like, yes, like having the agency and the choice and the sovereignty in that moment of like, yes, I choose to open this depth of my inner goddess nature with this man that's available for us now like what a gift you know and it it did again just like break the ceiling and create a whole new realm and a whole new experience of peak and um and the ability for me to have cervical orgasms yes specifically yeah which I had never experienced with another partner wow can you go more into that yeah with my partnerships and my self-pleasure for most of my life I always had clitoral orgasms Sometimes G-spot orgasm and, um, you know, I, during intercourse would pleasure myself to 
feel like I fully reached climax or have my partner stimulate my clitoris and that would feel like the full completion of Mm -hmm. orgasm. And um, just this, I think being ready to become a mother, you know, with my husband created this ripening of my cervix Mm. energetically and a deeper awareness to the cervix as this portal to spirit realm, this portal to the creation of the miracle of life. And I began having orgasms from that place in my body, which feels like the depth of my being and is such a deeper um, orgasm than the other kinds that I had experienced and feels like there's completion in orgasm without um, clitoral stimulation. You know, even the sounds we make being a sound healer, like in our pleasure, speak to where that pleasure is being sourced from. And before I met my husband, (laughs) my sounds for pleasure were very high octave, very high frequency, very like high soprano. Right. And with him and with the cervical orgasms in my body, it's become a much deeper Right. Sound. Yeah. Root chakra. Mm-hmm. Totally. More grounded energy. There's this book, <laughs> uh, Urban Tantra, which mm-hmm. I love and I talk about on this show all the time. But one section of the book talks about this and the sounds that we make during sex and how you can actually tune in with where the energy is and where it's moving based on the pitch mm-hmm. of, of your partner's sounds. Mm-hmm. So like lower tones being the root, obviously, you know this, but for those listening, and then as we move up through, you know, we're moving up through the heart space. It's like that it opens into this, like, ah, and then even higher, it's like, e. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's like, then it's like, sometimes there's just no sound at the top and it's, it's, it's wonderful. So I love that you bring this up and, Also, I just finished a 12-week men's course, the first cohort of The Conscious Man. It was an incredible experience. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And one of the things we talked about was sound and how Mm -hmm. to invite your partner to make sounds during sex in a way that feels safe for her because of the inextricable link between the yoni and the throat and the chakras being connected. And, and I've talked about this before too. If you look at a cross section Mm -hmm. of the female anatomy, sexual anatomy, and then of the throat and the openings and the musculature, they are very analogous. So Mm -hmm. there's something to be said, like we can, by opening the throat, we can open the yoni. And by opening the yoni, we can open the throat. And I love that relationship between the two. Mm -hmm. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like my singing at a young age was part of what allowed my sexuality to open Mm -hmm. at a young age and, and to carry that through. I, it's so phenomenal how interconnected our second chakra and our fifth chakra are second chakra being where we keep our creative organs, Mm. our creative energy, our deep, intimate, relational kind of energy. And then our throat chakra being the expression Mm -hmm. of that creativity. And I really believe that when with healing and with energy healing, looking at the connection that's happening between the second and the fifth Mm -hmm. is essential for becoming the full embodied Mm -hmm. creatrix for Mm -hmm. allowing that creativity that's harnessed inside of our being to be shared and expressed in whichever form it wants to come out Mm -hmm. in the world. It's so potent. So potent. So being that you're also an incredible energy healer and we're on this topic of Mm -hmm. sexual liberation if there are people listening to this who are saying that's me i i think i have stuck energy and i feel sexually repressed or i feel disconnected from my partner and i don't know where to begin what might be your advice to them sing Mm. sing sing when no one is listening, sing for yourself, sing in your car, breathe, 
fully into your body and allow your exhales to be audible, mm-hmm. like inhaling through the nose. <sighs> I hope everyone did that with us. And imagine that current of your exhalation starting at the top of your body and bringing the clearing of energy all the way down to your root, the higher pitch meeting the crown chakra, the lowest pitch meeting your root chakra. And you are having an experience of vibrational clearing Mm -hmm. of energy. Everything is energy. Everything is frequency. And so something so simple as that breath and that exhalation with sound is really inviting a release of what's story. Completely. And I also think that developing a self-pleasure practice, whether you're partnered or not, is critical, Mm -hmm. is critical. And I know for myself, when I first began on my own healing journey, I had resistance to that. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, mm-hmm. um, but I did. I just like, oh, I don't want to, I didn't feel like masturbating, which was such a key indicator that I probably needed to. And um, so again, throwing it back to things we covered with the with the men and the conscious man, it's like I invited them to reflect as men or boys when their first experience was with masturbation and to melt back into that experience and the awareness that You probably were just jacking off really fast, trying not to get caught, and then clearing the browser history, and then hiding the magazine or whatever it was. And like the energy behind that, Mm -hmm. being hide it, do it quick, shame. Mm -hmm. Not I ejaculate or I orgasm and I lie there with my hand over my heart appreciating the openness and juiciness of my body right now. Mm -hmm. So if your practice, think about all that's stimulated in the brain, all the chemicals that are released when we we orgasm. Mm -hmm. If you were in training yourself from a young age to orgasm and then have this follow-up of like shame Mm -hmm. right after, it's like... It's like conditioning. Yeah. It's literally conditioning. Mm -hmm. And so you're you're conditioned, you've conditioned yourself to follow the sexual experience with shame or quickness or the opposite of rest. So Mm -hmm. how do you expect when you get in partnership Mm -hmm. to be able to ejaculate and then lie there, like maybe keeping yourself inside of your woman Mm -hmm. for a while? And lying there feeling connected in your heart space, like there's no need to get up, rush mm-hmm. up, run away, clean off. It's like, mm-hmm. wow. And yeah. that takes training. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What you're speaking about of a man staying inside of a woman after orgasm and resting there, it's in tantra when a man replenishes his yin, like his feminine polarity gets to feel totally restored, filled up, rebalanced from that. And I believe in that as a practice with totally. my partner to hold that space and let him feel his yin mm. energy with at the end of lovemaking to rest there. It's really important and powerful. I love that. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned Tantra and When So several years ago when I began my healing journey, I actually lost my menstrual period for several years. Mm. No one could figure out why the doctor saw it. You know, I think I was 26 or 27 and they just diagnosed me with amenorrhea, which just basically means you don't bleed. And they said it was from a thin person with an active lifestyle or something like that. And they wanted to put me on drugs to force a period to come. And I was not about that at that time and still not. Um, but I was frustrated and it, you know, I tried all the things nutritionally. I was like, what's going to make this come back? Nothing was. And of course, part of it was control. Like I had control issues and and I wanted it to come so badly that I was, mm-hmm. my whole nervous system was stressed around it, which was part of the problem. But I started working with a tantric coach. This was like my last straw and I didn't know what tantra was. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea how this woman was going to help me 
get my period back, but I would have tried anything at that point. She started asking me all kinds of frustrating and hard questions about my my father, what was my relationship with my father, and what was my dating life like. And I was like, what does this have to do with my period? But there was so much emotional repression there that needed to be cleared and this deep, deep anger toward the masculine because of things that had happened that I had just bottled away and just a lifetime of absorbing the projection of male sexual energy and not having the tools. You know, we were, you and I were talking earlier, you know, outside even you were saying, you know, you had some interactions with just like strange interactions with cops or just like power dynamics where people projecting sexual energy onto you. And as females, you know, if it is physically vulnerable, it's like to use our voices to stand up, it's threatening to, to our lives sometimes. So unfortunately I would have to say that sexual assault is, is pervasive and it's probably more the norm than, than not. Mm -hmm. And when I started working with the men and the conscious man, one of the first assignments I gave them was to interview women in their lives on safety. And you brought up safety before. So this was the first time I had tried anything like this exercise and sent them off, said, okay, next week we'll hear about how that went for you. And it was really, really quiet in our chat. And I was like, huh, I wonder what's going on here. So I started to check in individually with each one of them and I realized they were unearthing deep, deep things. And they were silently kind of in their own processes of incredible grief because a lot of them went away and were like, oh, I interviewed one woman and she had these horrible stories. They were really harrowing. And I thought I better interview another woman for some balanced perspective. And then I interviewed that woman and she got picked up by these people and left in these, this field. And then I interviewed my grandmother and she had, you know, and it was like, they were hearing stories that they had never heard about the women most intimate to them, their partners, their mothers, their grandmothers, their aunts, their best friends. And they were like, wow, these women have been living with this and I've been completely oblivious to this aspect of their experience. Holy shit. Women are strong and they, you know, they've been through a lot. So I think it really rocked them. And I want to invite, you know, anyone listening to this too. It's like, if you haven't checked in with a woman in a while, about her experience of safety, whether you are a woman or a man, it's like, have that conversation. And, um, the more I think we can empower ourselves to understand each other, you know, it's not, it's not about blaming. It's not about saying the toxic masculinity men are horrible. It's like on both sides of the bridge, we need to extend an arm and say, hi, you're a human being. I desire deeply to understand your experience more so that my beingness, my soul can be more rounded out in this journey through knowing you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful. Powerful. I imagine all of the men had a chance to have an inner reflection with any time they had penetrated a woman without full consent. Right. Or without or even their lover without their lover being fully ready right for penetration right and that probably created some deep grief and self accountability just from hearing those stories that's mm-hmm. really potent and really powerful and so important for people to look at so, huge so grateful that you're doing that oh, kind of work thank you you as well yeah. you as well you, you you mentioned being fully ready and mm-hmm. that made me think of something that i heard about women who get chronic utis and yeast infections mm-hmm. it being coming from one possibility, obviously this is not medical advice, but energetically speaking, Mm -hmm. it comes from a place of not being fully opened, not being fully ready for that penetration. So yeah, that's huge. And shame. I had an experience just a couple years ago where I was with Charles before we were married and um, with my family and we went to a cousin's wedding that was a temple wedding, uh, my Mormon family's temple wedding. 
And Charles and I were making love in our hotel room and I was kind of like, be quiet, <laughs> like yeah. families around, like feeling that dynamic right. of like, I don't want anybody to hear us, you know, and right. I got the worst UTI. Yeah, I got the worst UTI and had to drink a bunch of cranberry juice and cleared it out just from the cranberry juice or D-manos. Um, but I noticed just being around the energy of the shame of my upbringing from Mormonism and family dynamics that that can be like the energetic cause of a UTI. So yeah, wow, it's wild. I want to dive into something that you and I have talked about previously, but mm -hmm. you became a mother mm -hmm. in the last year, mm -hmm. and the night that we first met, we were talking about this transition from the maiden archetype of youth and, you know, that effervescent beauty to this different sort of beauty mm -hmm. moving into motherhood. Mm -hmm. But something that is untalked about, I believe, is like the grief of, of that cycle mm -hmm. and the renewal into something new. But I would be so honored to hear from you what has that transition been like? And is there anything you can say to women who are either about to experience that or are, have experienced that, that maybe feel alone in their experience that you can offer? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have to admit my mind is still feeling um, connected to what we shared about women experiencing sexual violations and sexual trauma and I am a woman who was given GHB when I was 23 and was raped and have overcome a really intense healing journey with that. And as you mentioned that, I sat here in myself and thought, should I share it? Should I not share it? And there's always that voice of, can I say this out loud? Should I not say this out loud? And it just feels good to say, hey, I've healed that trauma enough to be comfortable and calm in myself as I talk about it. And for anybody who's gone through a journey like that, I highly recommend EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, a form of trauma therapy that's really powerful for resetting the amygdala, like the smoke alarm that goes off in the brain that makes us think that we're re-experiencing a traumatic situation when we're not when it's actually passed. And that healing experience I had with EMDR was so incredible. From the moment I had that therapy session, I never had another nightmare about it. I didn't feel this sense of threat. And that's what really inspired me to be go into psychotherapy to gain that training. And so for the past few years of my life, I've been rather open with that story. And I even had the, the whole detailed story about it posted on Medium. And it felt empowering to come out and share and to offer my skills and my services as a therapist to support women and support sisters who are overcoming healing sexual trauma and who are working on claiming their pleasure and learning how to orgasm again after being shut down from those sexual violations. I, I think in the healing arts, we can only really take people through a journey that we've been to. We can only really carry people or guide people as far as we've gone. So having gone through that experience of that healing myself, I am so in such a honor, deep state of honor and in so much love in my heart too hold space for women who are who are healing from that kind of journey. And to answer your most recent question, as a mom, now that my daughter is in the world, I'm really struggling with how much I want that story to be public because mm -hmm. I want my to be sensitive to her understanding of that. And I want her to hear that story from me before she hears it from anywhere else. So I recently went on Medium and deleted that story and took it off my bio on my website because I thought, let's just pause on this and consider now that my daughter is here, how is the responsible way to handle this as a parent, you know? Mm -hmm. And so 
Um, just wanted to like share that and let that out because it feels like such an important piece since you brought up trauma mm. and to share the depth of that and to remind all of our sisters who might be listening who have experienced any form of sexual violation that you are so not alone and it's happened to majority just like you said and we hold hands with many sisters of the world by having the healing experience of of that journey Mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that Mm -hmm. how do we as parents speak to children about these things particularly our daughters but also our sons Mm -hmm. how do we speak Mm -hmm. about these things in a way that creates the kind of future where this isn't happening anymore how what does a father say and what does a mother say Mm -hmm. in order to protect but not to instill fear Mm -hmm. where's that subtle energetic nuance of talking about these things to our children yeah that's the question yeah and it's an important thing for all parents to contemplate. Mm. I think I have had enough in my own upbringing of the secrecy and of the hiding and that these stories that cause grief for both men and women need to be expressed, need to be voiced. And through that, the energy of the rage and the anger, the resentment, the sadness, the pain gets to be released too. It's our duty Mm. as humanity to allow the expression of these energies that need to be cleared that have been repressed in our society and repressed culturally for a long time. And so I'm really in that. And I have to say becoming a mom has just been the greatest joy I've ever felt in my life. And the whole process of pregnancy and feeling so fertile and pollinated and conception, it's like the closest connection I've felt to source in my life, the closest connection I've felt to spirit realm is holding and forming and being the vessel for a spirit to come through Mm -hmm. and be incarnated and be born and seeing how divine and how beautiful that whole process is, how miraculous the whole process of pregnancy and birth and becoming a mother is really helped me to clear out any (laughs) residual shame that I had left in my body. I feel so much more comfortable talking about sexuality and talking about orgasm now because when it comes down to it, sex and fertility and conceiving and pregnancy and birth is like the holiest experience it's creation the most sacred mm. experience i've ever felt in myself so i'm so grateful to have had the next level of healing of the release and purge of my shame that i was holding on to from becoming a mother it's been really really powerful and potent to step into that and and that's been a beautiful part of it and like you were saying earlier in your question um yeah that it's the ultimate rebirth for me. Becoming a mother is the ultimate psychedelic experience and the ultimate rebirth. I had underestimated what a big integration period I'd be having in my first year of becoming a mom. And I'm still in it to be honest of integrating the ceremony of giving birth and the initiation of becoming a mother. And there is a direct change of my life before and my life after and throughout pregnancy I grieved a lot of okay saying goodbye to my maidenhood saying goodbye to my life saying goodbye to being able to meditate for two hours in a day and (laughs) go have my yoga practice and like have all that free time to write in my journal and now I live in constant devotion and constant attunement to my child. And it's made me so much more grateful for the small increments of getting 15 minutes to meditate or 15 minutes to write in my journal. And I feel that it's really key for women who are becoming mothers as a way to prevent postpartum depression for 
women to know how to grieve fully as the experience is happening. Like, yes, we're so excited to be pregnant. We're so excited to have a child. And yes, our life is really changing. Our relationship to ourself is completely shifted. Our relationship to our partner is completely altered. We go from being a dyad to a triad. It's a massive, major transition, the ultimate life ceremony. And to know how to grieve in real time as we process those changes by staying present with what those changes actually are, I think that allowed me to release a lot of the grief and sadness as it came through so that it didn't get stuck in my system and become overwhelming or surprising at how much my life had changed. And these simple rituals throughout the process to allow ourselves some space and time to feel and tap into those changes and to grieve the change of, okay, this is how my life was and now this is how my life's going to be. And that means that there's this ending to honor with this new beginning Mm. is so key and so important. I've asked myself this question a lot this last year since having a baby is, is postpartum depression really just women needing to learn how to grieve we had to really grieve, mm. you know, instead of repress the grief, repress the discomfort, repress the sadness, not make time and space for it, and then let it all catch up with us, yeah. right? And that's another thing we're not taught in school, right? how to feel our feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right. basic. Yeah. I feel like we should tell someone about this, yeah. put it into the curriculum. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Powerful. And... I'm, my mind is swimming around in what you said about birth being the ultimate psychedelic experience. And I know you don't say that lightly because I know we've spoken about (laughs) the level of psychedelic experience that you have. So I'd love to go into this a little bit more wherever your heart wants to guide this, either talking about, I know you've sat with ayahuasca a great many times and other medicines Mm -hmm. and I think you sh- you shared with me in the park a few weeks ago that you were actually training to maybe you were considering becoming an ayahuasca and serving the medicine mm-hmm. right when you found out you were pregnant, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm so happy to talk about this. Um, I have sat with grandmother 36 times and I've done 5 MLO DMT. That's a lot. About That's a lot of times. Five times. <laughs> yeah. Um, You know, when I was in graduate school for integral psychology, I got invited to try an ayahuasca ceremony in a really beautiful and safe church. How old were you? Holy church. 25. So 25 was your first experience. So what, in the last five years you've done? How old are you now? Um, I'll be 31. Okay. So five, six years, Mm -hmm. you've done 36 ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Okay. With grandmother. Yeah. Um, and 5-MeO-DMT came into my life just about a month before my first ayahuasca experience. And for me, um, going to grad school in integral psychology, it felt like this beautiful cocoon, a uh, structure to hold for two and a half years where on a personal level, I could integrate my ceremonial work from mm-hmm. the depth of understanding myself theoretically and psychologically and I had a majority of those ceremonies and experiences when I was in grad school for psychology. And it also created this natural understanding in myself of how to bridge the worlds of shamanism and of psychology, because that's the work I was doing in my own healing journey along the process. Um, so I'm super grateful that I had that time in my life to, to go so deep with plant medicine. And grandmother for me is absolutely my ultimate guide and teacher. And I love her so much. It took me 16 ceremonies until I started to really fully trust her. (laughs) And the depth of trust that I feel now is just so beautiful. My surrender feels so much more effortless and there's Mm. a lack of resistance. And yeah, I was considering, I was planning to go to the jungle to study with a member of the Shipibo tribe named Christina Mendoza and live on her property for a month to gain permission to begin serving the medicine. And and then um, 
became pregnant in August and so canceled that trip to Peru in November. Um, And in light of pregnancy, have had now almost the last two years of my life without a ceremony and have really just been honoring um, the natural (laughs) pharmacopoeia internal pharmacy of nature and biology of motherhood and of nursing and breastfeeding and have been called to not have any medicines during this time with nursing and um, throughout pregnancy, which there are some women who do continue their medicine work through. And that's cool too. I just think the first time I really wanted to experience it for its uh, subtle energies and its purity and see what that experience was. And it's been such a trip as I'm saying so I'm grateful that I um, didn't interfere with that process by having other medicines introduced to it and yeah I'm excited to um, begin ceremony again sometime when I um, stop nursing stop breastfeeding so how was the birth itself and you know I've just heard it it's, it's indescribable also if I don't know whether I'm assuming you had a natural birth. I, um, <laughs> I don't. I don't, don't want to make that I assumption. I had intended to. You had okay. Tell mm-hmm. me more about that. Let's yeah. talk about that. Um, yeah, I mean, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, you know, it's the we practice dying throughout mm-hmm. our life's journey to obtain enlightenment, and every ayahuasca ceremony for me all those 36 times over the course of six years and the 5-MeO-DMT experience was practicing the art of dying, the art of surrender, the art of trust, the art of saying, here's these aspects of myself that aren't serving me anymore. I'm going to release them. I'm going to let them go. And I'm going to fully embody and choose to step into these aspects of myself that are guiding me forward, that are my North Star, that's the direction of where I'm meant to go with my Dharma, with my purpose, with my soul's medicine and why I chose to be on this earth at this time. And wow, giving birth really to a child and becoming a mother was the ultimate experience of rebirth where in my journey I really did fear that I was going to die at one point and met that same place of like (gasps) fear resistance and then the slow trusting in life and surrendering and release of letting go that's such medicine for the soul to come into its most evolved version of itself Mm. inside of our full physical embodiment. So I just want to connect that with the psychedelic experience of ceremony and how I felt like that was mirrored through the psychedelic experience of actually giving birth for me. We had intended to do a water birth home here and I had taken um, Kim and Ami's course on orgasmic birthing and we have a couple of sisters in our community who had had orgasmic births and I thought why not shoot for the moon you know Mm -hmm. here and so I had done hypno birthing courses we took birthing classes on having a orgasmic water birth in our big bathtub in our bedroom and and then when my contraction started I actually had prodromal labor which means like false slash early labor. It's not a very good phrase for it because they're very real (laughs) contractions. Mm -hmm. There's contractions that happen without the body dilating, without the cervix dilating open. So for four days, I had had contractions 15 minutes apart with no dilation, like no progress. So I hadn't slept for four nights. I was exhausted. I was emotionally exhausted because I kept thinking, okay, it's happening, it's happening. And then it was like, no, it's not happening yet. So it would be like four hours of those contractions, 15 minutes apart, and then they'd stop. And so I called my midwife and I said, I'm exhausted and I'm not going to have energy to give birth naturally if this continues like this. We've got to do something. And so we took homeopathic phosphorus, remedy. And sure enough, something as subtle as that got active labor into gear. And I had contractions five minutes apart. And this was um, after a whole week, right, of that experience. And then um, 
I'd get dilated to an A. The midwives were here. We felt like she was coming any minute, and my body was so exhausted, I would just collapse and fall asleep for an hour and have rest, which is very unusual. Wow. For most women, once they get dilated to an aid, it means like the baby's coming really soon. You keep progressing until the birth is over. But I think because of the level of exhaustion my body felt, I'd get dilated to an eight and then just kind of collapse into a nap and then wake up again from the next round of contraction. So I labored at home for 16 hours in active labor with the wow. midwives here. And then eventually... Um, was going into shock a little bit um, from the pain and I was stuck on all fours. My sacrum was hurting so bad. I couldn't even crawl forward or stand up as her head got low into the sacrum. And being exhausted like that too really does affect your pain tolerance. I I was at a a heightened sense of like having a harder time tolerating the pain of the contractions At that point, so um, when my husband started to see me kind of going into shock and disassociating from the pain, that's when we got in the car, went to the hospital and got some support. And there was something for me about being in the hospital that actually made me feel so much um, more able to surrender. I All I wanted was to not go into a hospital. I was so attached to that idea. I didn't even pack a hospital bag. And this was right in the beginning of COVID too. So especially with that happening and all the unknowns in the beginning. Yeah, she was born May 2nd of 2020. Wow. And, you know, the universe gives us what we need. In my planning of birth, I thought so much about what kind of ceremony I wanted my experience of giving birth to be. And now that I've given birth, I realize that giving birth is the alchemy of our three souls myself, my husband, and my daughter, and I'm surrendered to whatever is being willed by that beautiful braided trifecta of our alchemy of souls as a family. And having the highest technology known to mankind to support human life is really important to me now, um, where in my initial thought, I didn't think that that was as important as um, you know, giving birth in the water or having it be done naturally at home. And so I had an epidural and I had Pitocin and I was the person least likely of all my friends to say it, but I was like, had never been more grateful for painkillers yeah. in my whole life. Because I'm glad you're speaking about they this. They resourced me. Like the pain medicine for me allowed my soul to fully come back into my body. And then mm. I could birth my baby vaginally. Mm. I really don't think I, at that level of, you know, five days of labor and the exhaustion could have pushed her out vaginally without the epidural. Personally, Mm. the epidural allowed me to have a vaginal birth. And it was so wild to go from the experience of the contractions with their intensity of like just high piercing pitched screams and screaming help and like feeling like my body was literally splitting into half Ugh. um to having the epidural and then they're like do you feel that little pressure on your rectum it's like yeah like that's a contraction like nothing like wow. painless wow. so then pushing and i slept for an hour at the hospital And then it was time to push and pushing. They were like, hey, you're about to have a contraction. Push with all your might. And it felt so calm and so like serene compared to what my experience had been at home. Um, And I think at home, I, I have more of a demeanor to be a host. And so I felt like I needed to help keep the space. The midwives asking me, where are your rags? And me showing them where the rags are. Like all those things kept me more in a place of control and less in a place of full surrender. And I hadn't taken that into consideration at all when deciding to have a home birth. And also I'm a very clean person. And birth is the messiest thing there is. (laughs) And for me, having the mess of my water breaking and getting my broken water around the house and the blood everywhere and 
um, the midwife tried to put like a glucose IV in my arm to give me some energy and she missed the vein and blood squirt on my couch. Like all of those factors right. and them uh, getting their stuff out of their bags as they need it felt really disorganized and chaotic. And all that stuff caused a lot of constriction in my body. I have a Virgo moon. So cleanliness and order and organization really helps me relax. And all of that stuff did not help me surrender. And that was a piece I had just not even taken into consideration right. and the choice to have a, a home birth. And then when Sophia was born, I pushed her out in 45 minutes and it went so smoothly. And by the time I got to the hospital, I was so grateful for their precision. Yeah, I was so grateful for the monitoring and their exact precision and what my body needed and what was going. Because I'd felt like the midwives at home had kind of been taking their best guess. Right. And they actually did... Um, put their hands in me during a contraction to see if her head was turned. And that was when I started going into shock because it reminded me of such pain wow. that I'd experienced. And it caused me to go from being dilated to an eight to a seven, I actually regressed from that pain when her head turned out to not even be turned. Right. So I think they did some interventions that caused me more pain that were unnecessary to experience. Yeah. So by the time I got to the hospital and had the precision and the nurse got the needle straight in my arm or right. exchanged my vein. Um, I was like so relieved. I was like, thank you. Like these people know what they're doing. And I could surrender because I felt so held by the teamwork right. and the triage. And that was another thing I had never thought of, like totally. the teamwork of the hospital. And so when Sophia was born, she had been in the birth canal for so long, she wasn't breathing right away. And she had to have her airways cleared. And so the moment she came out, she didn't cry immediately. She needed some help clearing her airways and I couldn't hold her right away. She was out of me and then taken to the corner of our room. And there were four doctors, a neonatologist, a respiratory therapist, these people that have like 12 years of schooling and training for working with newborns, four specialists with her while I had the doctor stitching me up and a nurse checking my vitals, watching my bleeding, making sure I didn't hemorrhage. We had six medical professionals in our room at the hospital, all together working on their own domains. And so two midwives at home would have been doing the job of like 10 people right. at the hospital. And that's a lot for yeah. some complications. Mm -hmm. So that was the most intense experience of my life. Like Sounds having those like five to seven minutes of my daughter out of my body and not being able to hold her. And yeah. I was just screaming like, give me my baby, give me my baby, let me hold my baby. And they're like, ma'am, we'll give her to you as soon as we can. Yeah. Is she okay? Give me my, like, I felt like in wow. ayahuasca, the liminal DMT space of the portal of life and death, of birth and death, the delicateness, the preciousness, mm -hmm. the impermanence of all life was just, poof, that portal was right there. And I had to stay in it. And finally, after what felt like forever, but was really only five to seven minutes, they handed me my daughter, Sophia, put her on my chest and she started nursing and having that riveting experience of like, oh my God, what if I lose this baby? And I'm thinking to myself, if she's not well, I want to die. Like, please, God. Yeah. I love this connection so much. Take me with her if she's not going to stay. Like, that's the level wow. of thought going through my head of facing death, right? And so then having her finally rest on my chest and having that reassurance as the contrast of she's a perfect, healthy, beautiful baby girl and we're alive was like, woo, like yeah. <laughs> being taken from the total like darkness to the total um, light. That and, is psychedelic. <laughs> and even with the epidural and even with the Pitocin and even being in the hospital room, I felt such a deep initiation in that moment. I saw spirits like in a lit up kind of silhouette of their bodies, acknowledging me, nodding, bowing of all different cultures, of all different traditions, like giving me this bow and this nod of like, welcome to motherhood, welcome to this next level of wow. responsibility. And it made me realize that 
no matter where you are, there's no way you could ever stop the ceremony of birth. We're going to have that spiritual shamanic experience, even in a hospital. Just being a hospital is not going to stop it from being the shamanic journey that many of us are intending to have. So, mm. and it really humbled me and made me feel so much more appreciation of Western medicine than I had in years. And for baby number two, my vision is definitely to be in a birthing center with a midwife and next to the most advanced technology known to humankind to support human life side by side. So that's where I'm Beautiful. at with my birth experience. And I know that they're all Beautiful. so different. And I've had many friends who had very successful home births and they have gone very smooth. So I totally um, honor and I'm so amazed by those experiences too. It just wasn't what was in the cards for me. <laughs> I think you brought up so many beautiful points and mm -hmm. what an incredible story that was, you know, I was feeling it in my nervous system <laughs> as you were telling it. But ultimately, like my biggest takeaway from that is you have to know yourself mm -hmm. and what works for you. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you have some things that you learned about that journey that, okay, this time it needs to be in an organized, clean space because I've got this Virgo moon aspect. And like, and it, that just comes from, you know, we live and we learn about what is perfect for us. And as you said, you know, we can empower ourselves to choose and to trust ourselves to mm -hmm. choose. Definitely. Totally. Yeah. And I think Sophia's spirit knew that she was going to need that support and she wasn't coming until she knew she had the support mm -hmm. she needed. And that was part of the miracle of her intelligence to get us to the hospital yeah. so, she, so she could have the support she needed when she was born. Because 30 seconds more of a child not breathing or one minute versus 10 seconds of a child not breathing can become cerebral palsy, right. can become imminent. Yeah, And so I was like, whoa. You know, her, yeah. whatever she needs yeah. and to have access and availability to anything she needs is such a higher priority now. Where I had seen women give birth in the Amazon jungle, no problem, by themselves in the water when I was younger. So my whole attitude during my whole pregnancy was like, I'll be fine. I want to go do it in the lake. Like right. women give birth every day. No big deal. <laughs> I was so casual with right. it. And now I'm like so humbled by like just how wow. precious human life really is. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Powerful, mm -hmm. powerful. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you so much for sharing that story. Mm -hmm. I think these sorts of stories don't get shared often enough. You know, it's like, how often do you get to peek in on somebody else's birth story of their child and mm -hmm. somebody else's experience with their sexual healing? It's, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. And as we close this, uh, one thing that I love about you and that your friends know about you. And I even picked it up in your speech when you were speaking about pregnancy, you you said the word pollinate mm -hmm. and pollination. And in your home, there are just little odes to bumblebee, honeybees everywhere. And, you know, you're, some of your friends call you Brandolin Bee mm -hmm. and you have this beautiful bee um, drum. drum above my head. Mm -hmm. And when I came in here, you were talking about shifting your whole ethos, your whole branding from the singular bee to this idea of the hive and family and community and connection. So just, I think this would be a wonderful way to end is tell me about your infatuation <laughs> with this animal totem of the bee and where that came from for you and why that's so magical. Yeah. Actually, the first time I learned how to meditate, my first meditation retreat I ever did, which was three days long when I was 18 and rediscovering spirituality again through yoga and meditation. I was riding my bicycle home from that meditation retreat and got stopped in my tracks on the Boulder Creek path by a bee swarm. And a bee swarm just looks like a real portal before your eyes of like that flashing black and white and yeah. buzzing. Of, and it was 
the beginning of me going through that portal and rediscovering myself as a spiritual being after I'd had those few years of kind of going through a dark night of the soul's journey when I was processing um, my Mormon upbringing still. So then synchronicities continued to happen with the bees where they would leave little gifts for me of honeycomb and I'd come home and a bee would be at my door and it'd dance for me and my eyes would follow the lines of the bee and feel like this energy medicine right through following that and and without going into the whole story because that could be a whole other hour I felt divinely guided by bees and came to learn about the mythology of the bee priestess in both Egyptian and Greek philosophies of the bees symbolizing holding community together and nature's ultimate reproductive organ and the divine feminine, the Mm -hmm. matriarch of that nourishing salve, the cohesion that keeps tribes and people together. And in Egyptian mythology, it was the bee priestesses, the Melissae that taught Osiris the arts of divination, how to read the signs in nature to prophesize the future, right? Mm -hmm. So throughout ancient mythology, there's so much sacredness to the energy of bees around divination and intuition and the divine feminine and being such an ultimate symbol of creation that they're my North Star. And the day I first got invited to do 5-MeO DMT, I was beekeeping with my bee mentor. And all my beekeeping mentors have been like my guides into quantum physics and into psychedelic universes. And bees (laughs) have been a guide for me like such a strong guiding force so um they just remind me of my intention to be that cohesion that helps people to feel a sense of belonging in themselves and in community and to be in a healthy expression of their creativity and of their divine feminine energy and are so connected to the spirit realm and keeping nature alive and this appreciation for being a keeper of the earth as well. That's so important at this time. So it's a little bit, which I could say so much more about why bees for me, they're just such magical beings and they are live in such devotion. I feel such a reverence for life and for our produce, for our food, for our flowers, with the the service that bees give to our whole planet. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. They, they look like aliens. I actually think that they are <laughs> part connected to an extraterrestrial lineage and bring like a whole wisdom and a whole energy mm. of healing to our planet that feels otherworldly and from higher dimensions. The most ancient form of acupuncture was with bee stingers, wow. bee venom therapy. Before we had acupuncture needles, huh. people were touching the meridian points on the body with stinging, it stinging with, with bees, bees and, wow. and the actual venom. And stimulating, opening these channels. Mm-hmm. Bee stings are gifts. Wow. My first ayahuasca ceremony, I had a bee sting me through my shirt no at way. the base of my spine. No way. Yeah. And on San Pedro, <laughs> absurd. I had a bee sting me on my left side of my foot, like grounding my feminine side, um, right at the four gates point. Wow. Between your pinky and second toe. Okay. The bees so, are very connected with you. And I know all these beekeepers who have these amazing healing stories of bees stinging them in certain points that give them incredible healing. So there is that relationship with each beehive of they know your body and they'll give you the medicine they need in a really wow. profoundly magical way. I love that. I mean, so many people are so afraid of bees and I love just the reverence that you have for them. The nectar of the goddess yeah. and Amrita. Mm. To me, that same nectar and honey and royal jelly and magic of all those high potent medicines that bees produce is yes. the same nectar that flows from the goddess when we reach orgasm, female ejaculation, yes, Amrita, all these beautiful, divine, decadent nectars, salves of of nature. Tell me, unpack Amrita for us 
who have never heard that term. Yeah, Amrita is a Sanskrit word that actually means immortality. And Amrita is what is known in Tantra as what fluid, nectar, is secreted juicy (laughs) from a woman when she has female ejaculation amazing yeah and it's so beautiful that our nectar our goddess nectar is in its sanskrit meaning immortality because in that space of such a deep connection to source and to spirit we are connecting to our soul we are connecting to that infinite aspect of ourself the part that never dies and i believe in deep sacred sexuality we can remember that aspect of ourself we replenish that part of ourself mm. our soul mm. Brandolyn, <laughs> this I could just talk to you forever about all this <laughs> stuff so we'll probably have to do this again but mm-hmm. This has been so gorgeous and beautiful to share this heart space with you, strong feminine space. I see that in you. I see your strength. I see all that you've walked through in not very many years of life. You are far wise beyond your years. And thank you for titrating your wisdom into this golden nectar and Mm. serving it to humanity in the way that you do. I want to ask you for anyone listening who felt a deep resonance with you today and would like to connect with you outside of of this podcast, where can people find you, either a website or on social media? Yeah, I'm on Instagram and I have a website, both the same name, Brandilyn B. That's B-R-A-N-D-I-L-Y-N. B E E, Brandolyn B.com or at Brandolyn B on Instagram. And I'd love to connect with you. So please reach out if you're in need of any support or just a sister. I got you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. 